In this video, I'm going to do a couple short demos of decision trees in Scikit-Learn in a Jupyter Notebook, and then we'll talk about begging. So what we're going to do here is build a decision tree on a simple data set. I'm going to, of course, import NumPy, Scikit-Learn, and the tree subpackage of Scikit-Learn, and we're going to plot some things in Matplotlib. So to make some sample data to play with, I'm going to take 20 random points um, in a normal distribution around negative one zero and make those green, and another 20 points around one zero and make those magenta. So if we look at this picture, it looks something like this. Now what we want to do is build a decision tree which can classify green versus magenta. So what I'll do is um, I'm going to, of course, use the cross-validation and, and training testing split tools in scikit-learn, and we will break that data set, again, it's only um, 40 points total, into a training and testing set using train test split. The training points, we have 32 of them. Testing points, we have 8 of them. So that's a 80-20 split. Now let's instantiate a decision tree classifier from scikit-learn. So that's what I'm going to call T. T, we're going to fit it to the training points. So, of course, we feed it the training points and their corresponding labels. Of course, Scikit-Learn tells us a little bit about what it's doing. It generates, um, you know, it, it has a, a Gini index, a max depth, and so on. So um, we can ask it to do that. And actually, since we know how decision trees work, let me set the max depth right away. Let's say max depth is equal to, let's say, 4. So if you think about the max depth of a binary tree, that should give us roughly 16 regions. Um, well, up to 16 regions on which we can make decisions. We can predict the value of a new point by, oops, sorry, by giving it an array. Say if I give it the point 2, 0, it thinks that's going to be magenta. If I get the point negative 2, 0, it thinks that's going to be green. Okay, so what is this actually doing? I'm going to set up kind of a complicated graphing system here, uh, a complicated plot. What I'm really going to do here is build uh, is show you the training set and then I'm gonna take a a grid of points and uh, 200 by 200 points and we're just gonna color every single point either green or magenta as the as the model tells us this is gonna take a little bit to draw because to test all 40,000 points and this is what it comes up with it looks kinda weird right as a human you'd say look you've got a blob of magenta on the right and a blob of green on the left and they sort of overlap but the way the decision tree works, it has to cut linear boundaries that correspond with the axes. So it makes some vertical cut, and then it cuts that half space into smaller pieces, and so on. So these are the cuts it decides to make. Using GraphViz, which is a nice graph, uh, sort of graph theoretic plotting tool, um, we can look at what it actually is deciding here. So it's first of all making a cut at x0 less than or equal to negative 0.781. That's probably this vertical line right here. It's cutting there. And then based on whether that's true or false, it's going to start subdividing the data more and more and more. So we have an ultimate case of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, what we got here, 9, I think, different regions it comes up with. And those um, come out of this picture. So it doesn't look like 9 because these look contiguous, but in fact, if you think about this, every single vertical horizontal line has to involve some sort of cut. So there's a cut here, 1, 2, 3, 4, five, six, seven, I can maybe count. Maybe there's some more refined ones in there. Of course, we can predict on the uh, on the testing set, it actually does surprisingly well. Um, if we do a cross-validation, it does reasonably well. 70% accuracy. It's not great, but it's okay. Again, the one thing I want to point out about decision trees is that they're very chunky, right? They're very pixelated and prone to overfitting. So let's use a greater tree depth. I'm going to go back and change the tree depth to, let's see, if I've got 32 points, a tree depth of like 5 or 10. Let's do a tree depth of like 9 and see how that comes out. So with a tree depth of 9, look at this. It manages to get essentially every single point correct, but by making some very strange cuts. It made a very small vertical cut right there to isolate that one green point. I think that magenta one's on the other side of that line. So 
by making enough cuts, it's able to exactly classify every single point, but it's obviously overfit because if this green point weren't there, or if it were moved left or right, it's misclassifying a whole bunch of things. Let's see here. So if you look at the um, if you look at the different leaves here, Gini index of zero, Gini index of zero, Gini index of zero, Gini index of zero, 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 zero. Yeah, so based on this, it has completely isolated all of the points. They're all perfectly isolated. So this is extremely overfit. And again, the reason I say it's overfit is if you were to jiggle any individual point, the model would change dramatically. So if that green point weren't there, or if that magenta point were a little bit to the right, you'd have to do a whole different fitting process over here. It's really extremely overfit. And that keeps happening. So if we fit, let's, let's uh, add some more points here. Let's make maybe 200 points like that. So I'm just going to up the data set size here to 200. And let's plot those points. Here's those points. Now if I have a total of 400 points, hmm, let's do, actually a depth of 9 should still do it, shouldn't it? Let's maybe do a depth of 10 just to make sure it's clearly overfit. Again, overfitting is bad, but I just want to demonstrate what's going on here. So again, oh, that's the wrong data set. Oop. I didn't rerun these segments. All right, let me rerun these. I think I just skipped over a couple segments here. They're going to 320 points. Sorry about that. It always happens to the Jupyter Notebook because you forget to rerun a, a block. So here you can really see overfitting happening. Obviously by random chance there's some magenta points here and there and with a tree depth of what was it nine or ten that I just put in? With a tree depth of ten you can get 1024 different subregions here and man you know it's really trying to get every single magenta and green point isolated. It's trying really hard and that's just absurd and there's no reason you should have a model that fits that tightly to these individual random points. So um, decision trees are fairly simple, they're fairly dumb, they overfit very easily. Let me demonstrate a similar phenomenon now for regression trees. So let's do a regression tree, again using a tree for regression. And again, to be able to visualize it, I'm going to have one input variable and one output variable. So let's make sort of a sine wave here. If you look at how I generated this, I took a 100 points from 0 to 4 pi, and I took their sine and then add a little bit of noise to it. A little, you know, 20% noise to the signal. And um, let's plot that. It looks like this. So it's a sine wave. Now we're going to fit a regress a decision tree regressor to this. And let's use a max depth of 2 so that we can see the tree. So we're going to cut this in um, in half and then in half again. Again, not really half, but cut it and then cut each of those again to do a fit. And let's plot that. Here's the plot. So it cuts somewhere, then it cuts somewhere else, and cuts somewhere else. So I plot this as line segments, but you can see, you know, it's on at this cut, it's taking that average, at this cut, it's taking that average, and so on. If you look at the actual decision tree itself, it's cutting at x0, our variable is 2.96, so it's cutting about here, and then it's cutting at 0.8, and so on. And each time it's trying to minimize the error, um, the mean squared error, on that subregion. And that's how it's choosing these cut points. Now we can get a better model if we increase the, the depth. So let's do a depth of, I don't know, let's do a depth of six. So I'll have two, roughly two of the six different things. And here, you, again, you really see the overfitting happening. Because of a couple outlying points, it's making the model jump up and down to try to fit those points. So this is what overfitting looks like if you're doing regression. It's trying to fit each individual point. Some of them it skips because it doesn't quite have enough depth. But if we make the tree depth even higher, let's say a tree depth of 10, that's extremely overfit. Right? It's trying hard to hit every individual point in his, uh, by, by cutting the, by slicing and taking a new average. So how do we improve this overfitting problem? Well, there are three main tools. One is called bagging, which is short for bootstrap aggregating. That's a, a portmanteau that kind of irritates me, to be honest. But it's bootstrapping, or in other words, taking an, a subsample and averaging them. There's um, random forests, which is a more clever way of doing that bagging process, where you avoid them interacting too strongly. And then there's boosting, where you grow the tree layer by layer, gradually, only focusing on the things that were previously wrong, 
in such a way that you're you're gradually building a model. So the idea is that the, the slower you learn, the less you're going to overfit, or at least the less quickly you will overfit. So now let me show a very simple idea of bagging. And I'm not going to use any fancy library here. I'm just going to have it work by hand. Okay, so I'm going to set up a very similar system. Import NumPy, import scikit-learn, matplotlib, etc. In fact, this time I'm going to re let me restart this so that we know how it's going to run. I'm going to do a similar model, so 100 random points between 0 and 4 pi, and add some noise to a sine wave. So here is our signal. Here's the training set. We're going to do a regression tree. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take those 100 points, and I'm going to make samples from them. I'm going to draw samples. I'm going to draw samples, uh, each, each bag with replacements. I'm going to call these bags, since the process is called bagging. So of the numbers from 0 to 99, I'm going to draw 33, draw 33, and draw, draw 33. Notice I'm not, I'm doing this with replacement. So I'm, I'm allowing, you know, something to occur in bag 2 that was also in bag 1. And now of those three samples, subsamples, I'm going to make their x, their in, their predictors and responses arrays. So I have x1, y1, x2, y2, x3, y3 are th these three different bags of training data. To each of those bags, I'm going to fit a decision tree. So I've got tree 1, tree 2, and tree 3. Now each of those trees can predict a value. So if I want to average those, um, those bootstrap samples, all I have to do is take each of their predictions and average them. So I'm going to make a consistent testing set, which is equally spaced points from 0 to 4 pi. Let's take 1,001 of them. Let's... Um, apply each of the three tree models to that testing data and we will simply take their outputs and average them and call that y hat bagging. So if we do that and we plot the different models, this is a little confusing to look at, but we have um, the sort of uh, pink model, the green model, and the blue model. These are the three individual models that came from a, random, from a, from a tree on a random subsample a bootstrap sample. And if we average the values of those three different regression trees, we get the black regression curve. Now the idea here is that because the green, the pink, and the blue were built on different subsets of the data, or subsets of the data that may or may not be the same, they may overlap, but they don't have to. They're fairly unlikely to overlap very much, of course. That it should, in some sense, wash out the overfitting. At the same time, it also is actually sort of an enhanced model in the sense of, of intervals, because in this case, I built them all of depth four, so they each have like 16 different intervals at most. <clears throat> but if you think about it, if I average 16 different trees, which are cut at different points, then, so for example, this, um, because of where green and pink and blue cut in different points, you can get more refined information in black. Now that might lead to overfitting like it sort of does right here, but typically, as you know from statistics, if you have three identically, identically and independently sampled random variables, say x1, x2, and x3, if you take their average, the variance goes down by the number of samples you've taken, so that would be three. So in a theoretical sense, the variance of the bootstrap model, of this bagging model, being the average of three other models of all the same variance, should have a third of the variance. So we expect the variance to go down in the, um, in the bagging model. So that's all that bagging is. It's simply taking th uh, bootstrap samples of your data, that, again, that's different samples with replacement, making a model on each one of those, and then averaging those models. You can do the same thing for classification. Of course, what do you mean by averaging and classification? You usually interpret that as voting. So if you have three different bootstrap uh, models um, drawn from your data, then if they have like a green versus blue um, decision to make, you'd simply ask them to on any input point to vote green versus blue and two of the three win. So averaging for decision is essentially voting. And whether that's plurality voting or do something more sophisticated, that's sort of up to you. But um, the notion still makes sense of sort of averaging the submodels. The other methods, which are random forest and boosting, are a little bit more sophisticated. But 
in the end, they come down to the same basic idea of taking bootstrap samples and trying to somehow combine them in a way that's useful and decreases variance.